this idle model is a real dilemma for uh, those of you who know me without out a single creative bone in his entire body. But uh, we'll, fortunately, we're blessed by having uh, leaders in this organization who are intensely creative. So one of the things that I do know is when you have those kind of people, get out of their way and don't impede their progress. So you're going to get a chance to see these individuals. Can, how do we get the PowerPoint? So what I'm going to do is uh, we've selected three of our uh, greatest achievements over the last uh, funding period, the last four years. And these are perfect examples of what Clay introduced. Uh, they are things that we started in our building phase, but there are three things that are going to be essential for our sustainability and our um, uh, success in meeting uh, the growing and emerging needs of all of our investigators. So uh, the only creative contribution I made to this uh, is the title, uh, uh, just to get you tasted over lunch. And for those of you who don't know, the clinical research uh, services aspect of the CTSI is a large group of individuals that provide uh, a number of services for our investigators, including inpatient units, outpatient facilities, nursing facilities, a number of cores, bionutrition, sample processing, body composition and metabolism, and a number of other new cores uh, that we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to introduce the three topics and then let the uh, individuals tell you about them. The first is our cost uh, recovery initiative, which is something that's going to be key to our sustainability and is really driven by the uh, incredible emerging needs of our investigators who are increasing the utilization of our services exponentially over the last four years. It is led uh, by Linda Jacobson, who is our new Deputy Director of Clinical Research Services, who joined us a couple months ago from her position as the uh, Director of Administration for the Helen Diller Cancer Center. So she's ideally poised to uh, help us uh, with our acceleration and integrate us with some of the other major uh, organizations on campus that deal with similar issues. The second uh, really exciting topic for us, anyway, is the Research Participant Recruitment Corps Service, led by uh, Nariman Nasser, who uh, is formerly from Jeff Bluestone's Immune Tolerance Network, uh, where she was responsible for operational development and implementation of clinical trials. So this is a natural collaboration with our uh, emerging uh, entry into supporting our investigators for clinical trials. Last but certainly not least is our Clinical Coordinator Core Service, which is an example of a faculty-driven service that we have started over the last couple years. It's led by Danusha Filipowski, who um, is the, uh, finished her uh, medical training and then joined us after a many-year history of supporting high-level clinical research here at this institution. So I am going to turn this over to Linda to give you our first uh, idol possibility. Linda, please. Thank you. So uh, very quickly, I'll just share the, the goals of the cost recovery initiative. It starts with our desire to continue to provide high quality services uh, to the campus and to the investigators in support of clinical research. And actually to go a step beyond that, to work to expand and develop new services, to work with investigators to understand their emerging needs and how we can be helpful as we go forward. A, a very basic um, goal within this project sounds very simple, but it's not, and that is to understand the full cost of providing these services. Services in the CRS include nursing services, both inpatient and outpatient, and working in that environment makes it very complicated to understand exactly what the costs of doing business are. And in the end, we want to optimize the use of our facilities and our resources. And why now? Why are we doing this now after many years of providing these services? There's a lot of pressure on us. There's a lot of pressure on increasing costs, uh, the general fiscal complaints that we're all, uh, constraints that we're all facing, and we anticipate that we'll see some decreases in NIH funding. We want to actually begin a change in our culture and to begin to think about us all having a shared investment in these core services. And we want to leverage the funding that's out there. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure we're managing those resources well. So moving forward, we have d developed, we've drafted, and are near finalizing a set of cost recovery principles. Those principles were put together by a task force, our cost recovery task force, which consisted of a number of engaged faculty members and stakeholders who 
put together a set of principles that will guide us as we go forward in developing policies. Those principles say that we're going to grandfather existing studies and the agreements that we have had in the past for how we will support and fund their services. But it proposes that going forward that we're going to ask investigators to invest a minimum of 40% of the cost in the projects that we're helping them to support. But at the end of the day, the most important part of it is that we have a full commitment to working with investigators to deal with whatever financial, fiscal uh, constraints that they're facing. We know it's important, and we are committed to working with people on a case-by-case -case basis. So in my area, we're getting ready to share with the campus the goals and the uh, strategies that we're looking at in this cost recovery initiative. We're going to continue. We have been working with investigators already, helping them understand the costs included in their proposals for our services. Ooh, yay, what'd I do? Just anywhere. Just anywhere? There we go. And uh, we're working right now with people on uh, estimated rates for the services. And we're going to move forward and develop and publish formal rates that will be available to people on the web and that, we, that people can look at and understand what it would cost to use the services. But very important to me is that we're also going to refine what we're doing internally so that we're sure that when we're doing all of this, we're doing it on a timely basis and meeting all of your needs. So I look forward to working with many of you as we go forward. Thanks very much. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about the participant recruitment services, which are coming online very soon, probably in the next four to eight weeks. Wrong way. Uh, I'm going to really boil it down to three things. Supporting, increasing, and improving recruitment for all of the investigators here at UCSF and with the affiliates. First, we're going to support the recruitment activities. We've made a commitment and have already kept to that commitment uh, with our staff to date who are all trained and very well versed in clinical research operations and each of them brings a unique skill set along with that that pertains to some uh, specific aspect of recruiting participants into clinical, tr clinical studies. As part of our service, we're going to be providing a full consultation and recruitment analysis of the landscape for your study, and then also providing a plan that can be implemented in a very staged approach and will also come with a budget and timeline so that folks can understand the best way to recruit their study over a specific period of time. Secondly, we're going to increase the participant pool. This is really what it's all about. We need more potential participants to get into all of these studies that we're recruiting for. We're going to do that in two very distinct ways. One is that we have developed a research participant registry, which is for the public to come in and volunteer, providing a brief health history and uh, their consent to be contacted for future research. That will become a pool from which we can recruit participants for any study. And secondly, we can um, make more efficient by centralizing the method which we use to recruit folks out of the integrated data repository, which is the research repository from which we derive um, fields from the electronic medical record for recruitment purposes. And lastly, we're going to improve the efficiency of recruitment efforts. By centralizing these efforts with us, not only are you gaining our expertise, but investigators are also able to take advantage of the fact that we can leverage a lot of um, vendor opportunities and we can also take advantage of um, economies of scale in terms of recruiting across campus and across the medical center. Thanks. I want to talk to you briefly about the clinical research coordinator services that have been um, part of our new initiative. A um, little bit about our origins. We are a new CT site service that was inspired completely by investigators' needs and requests. It was initially piloted for about a year by Drs. Wara, Puck, and Milosevic, and uh, we had one coordinator, and that coordinator uh, was in charge of about four studies across those three departments. It was so successful that luckily I got a job in August of 2010 <laughs> um, and was asked to create an official CTSI service. Um, in the 10 months that I've been on board, we've grown to a staff of five people and I'm currently still hiring one more. And all of our coordinators are supported 80% by recharge from the PIs and 20% by the CTSI itself. A uh, little bit about our development. Uh, our coordinator services, basically we provide any service that an experienced coordinator can do. We uh, work with all UCSF PIs, all departments and all specialties, all locations where UCSF PIs conduct research and 
pretty much everything else, obviously within reason. <laughs> um, we are starting an education initiative, creating a curriculum for anybody who works in clinical research. Um, it's starting out with brown bags and um, small workshops, and eventually we hope to have a certification program, whether we create our own or adopt one that already exists is still to be decided. And I'm also working sort of as a switchboard for coordinator services, which means that if somebody is looking for coordinator, we can't provide them. I will know possibly about coordinators that have some time, and we can put them together um, to make things work. Quickly, our induction, we've done 45, uh, we've had 45 requests for service in the last year. We have supported 32 studies, five of which are early career investigators. These are the lists of all the sites that we are currently in, um, supporting, which include satellite sites outside of the regular UCSF system, like our RAI dialysis center at Haight and Cesar Chavez. And then a quick list of our specialties. Oh, I'm about to be kicked off the stage. One third pediatric, two thirds adult, and a long list of subspecialties that you can see there. Thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs> Great work, CRS. So, um, a, a virtual rock opera of achievements. <laughs> so, Sam, you want to uh, start us out? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to congratulate Linda and make a consultation appointment. Uh, because you basically described uh, a new recharge tax and got applauded for it. Uh, uh, I've tried several times uh, in the last three years to do that and have been booed off the stage on each occasion, so, so congratulations on that. Um, on the coordinator pool, I, I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, when, when I think back to my time as a, as a chair in pediatrics, I, I tried over and over again uh, to get people to, to share uh, coordinators, but everyone kept coming back to me to say, no, we have to have our own. They only understand what we're doing. And I was just wondering how, how you got over that barrier of people feeling like they each had to own their own and, and make a pool successful. I think the uh, we had an unlikely ally in uh, making that happen, and I think it's just the fiscal reality we live in. Uh, the very fact that finances are so constrained means that people are uh, more cooperative, certainly in California, maybe not in Washington, but cer certainly here, and I think that's really been the difference. So if you can get a study, our study coordinator for uh, one need that comes, uh, finishes the need, and then leaves. You don't have an FTE. You don't have all the other things that you have to do with a full-time coordinator. I think that's really one of the major drivers. Would you agree? Absolutely. And all those startup costs, too. You know, the uh, posting a job, job description, interviewing all those candidates, you know, reviewing all those CVs, all that's gone, too. And then we absorb the vacations and all the other sorts of things. Uh, so it, it really is a very uh, uh, scientific and fiscally uh, responsible thing for investigators to do. Are we attempting to quantify the, the the shift? I mean, how many coordinators we had employed for X number of studies before this initiative and, and after to see what true economies we can achieve? Uh, we're starting to keep some of that data. We don't have very much yet at this point. Still early. You know, we do it, not enough people to really make a huge impact on campus yet, but it could be a great model for the future. Talmadge. So I had a corollary of Sam's question about cost. So one of the things that's pretty common here is that a, a lot of the things that actually cost us money are buried in other things. Mm -hmm. So when you try to pull it out and shine a light on it and say, you have to pay for it, it collapses the, the system. And so <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm, I'm curious, how are we going to, when you, when you pull this out, how are we going to overcome that underlying uh, pressure that, that this was actually a cost that was buried in in our system, and, and there was no money for it, really, but there is real money, there's real costs in it. And the, the other part of that question, I'm sorry for the two-part question is, and I think you answered this, you are actually the deep pocket, <laughs> and how are you paying for it? So, okay, so let me try to answer the second question first. Uh, Deep pockets in the sense that we do have the luxury and the privilege of having NIH support. So that is the uh, money that we're using to grandfather in the uh, studies that have already existed so we don't have to, you know, change any agreements that have been made. And it also allows us uh, the, the resources to support the uh, career development of early uh, career investigators who don't have uh, the grant wherewithal to run any of these kinds of studies. 
Um, I think as uh, time goes by and we can anticipate that some of that support will decline, uh, that's why the recharge will give us uh, added resources to uh, provide support to our investigators. The other advantage that we can use those deep pockets for, uh, and this came out of our faculty-driven task force, is that we can now provide a safety net for our investigators who may experience a arbitrary uh, cut across the board of the budget of their grant. So if you have an R01, for instance, with four specific aims, and it has a wonderful scientific score and that goes to council and loses 25% uh, of its budget, you're in a catch-22 because at the, when you go for your competitive renewal, you have to show progress on all four aims, yet you only have the budget for three. We can underwrite that. And that's, I think, one of the things that we wanted to come up with to help the investigator community embrace this. So I think this was a very clever thing that this uh, task force came up with that we've embedded into our principles that hopefully will help us uh, help us move this forward. Um, your other question is absolutely on target, the hidden costs. I don't know that there's a single place that I've ever worked that really understood the costs of doing anything, let alone clinical research in an academic medical center. We've spent the last year trying to pull back the, uh, the layers of the onion. We have a costing tool that I think does a pretty good job, but it doesn't hit everything. So I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to work with the chairs and the divisions as we go forward to make sure that we're being accurate and not overcharging, but also not undercharging as well. So, if I get, so there's one, thank you, but there's one other question that I, that I wonder how you're going to solve it. Maybe somewhere later in the presentation it will be answered, but underrepresented minority participants on clinical trials is a problem everywhere. Yes. And, and I think it's a significant problem it's here. It's a huge problem. And, yeah. and so I wonder, are there special things being done to try to uh, do it? Nehrman, do you want to? Yes, I, I think Nehr I'm going to uh, let Nehrman feel that. That's an extremely important question. Yeah, and, and this is something that comes up every day, I think. Uh, one thing that we're trying to do is, of course, this research participant registry, but along with that, not just putting it out there and hoping that they will come, but actually when we go to promote the registry in the public, going into the community, having materials available in their language. I have two people on my staff who are um, Spanish speaking and actually do Spanish translation. So even in our pilot work, we're already making sure that we're including not only Spanish translation, but potentially Cantonese translation. So we're already thinking about that before we even begin and making sure that we even engage investigators who haven't thought about it when they come to us and make that available to them. And involve in the experts that yeah. already exist on campus. Yeah, but you, all, you, you, you will have a major advantage that we haven't had, and that is if you have a stable of coordinators who are consistent, one of the things you can present to the minority community is that consistency, because that's what they really hate, is that the people come and go. So if you train your coordinators so that they understand diversity, that they're comfortable with it, and they then appear in the minority community at, at events and things like that, it'll change, I think, overnight. And we have some successes in that already with our uh, clinical research unit and, uh, and presence in the Tenderloin, where we are touching some extremely uh, 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 underserved populations in, in that neighborhood. Uh, and that's uh, been a model that Nariman and, and uh, Danusha have been working through and with. Great. Good. David. Well, I agree here uh, a lot with Randy and Paula. <laughs> <laughs> um, he volunteered to be Paula. Bear, right? <laughs> and, and now we know who Simon is. <laughs> That's right. So uh, as a grandfather, how do I get grandfather status? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> on that one. There's got to be some link here across the different cores. And just the last question that we're dealing with, uh, interactions with the community core to build that kind of relationship uh, for, for having recruitment? Is that a question to ask? A question. No, no, that's fine for this group. Yep. Yeah. Do you, Nehrman, do you want to? Sorry. Why don't you answer this one? Um, you were talking about the community? The community core. 
Uh, the community engagement program, yep. yeah. So, um, you know, we haven't started our operations, but certainly I've been in close contact with the um, with the community engagement program, and they are definitely on the forefront of working together with us when we get ready to send out the message in the study-specific way. Um, but one thing um, that my group is already doing in terms of working with the community directly is we're helping to sponsor a national event in November called Aware for All, which is um, managed by a nonprofit that provides education for research participation. And I think that that's one way we can start putting ourselves out there as an institution that wants to work with the community. And that particular event is focused on minority populations, so. Great, all right. Very nice, great harmony here. And yeah, and yeah, don't one other, one other thing to, to, to uh, leverage off of your last question is that uh, even though we're presenting this in terms of our specific areas of responsibility, I think it's very important that it comes out that we're all working together. So the, all of the, the clinical research cores, not only the three here, but the others that I mentioned, are working very closely with community engagement uh, because we are really providing those investigators and the collaborations they make outside of our system, we're giving them the tools so that they can be much more effective. And I think that's one of the wonderful advantages that this organization can provide that if we were doing this separately, we wouldn't be able to provide. Great.